Uh, welcome everybody to the session. Very, very happy uh, to be participating in this session. Uh, very happy for MNL to be a partner in hosting this important conversation. Uh, I want to thank the RPLC and the Canadian Regional Development Team for pulling all this together and for continuing this very important research and debate. Uh, for our province in particular, this topic is extremely timely and foundational to what our society is going to look like in 20 years, maybe less. Um, the first thing I'd like to do is call on Kelly Vaden uh, to give a, a very brief little introduction, and then I'll introduce our speakers and go through the outline. So this webinar is part of a national uh, research project that's been going on now. We really began initially oh, no, black, looking at developments in regional development in Canada over the last five years. We're really into a sixth year of knowledge mobilization. And the project was funded by SHRC, Social Science and Humanities Research Council, with support from each of the partner institutions, uh, which I like to recognize. So we had uh, myself from Memorial University leading the project, along with Sean Markey from Simon Fraser University, David Douglas at Guelph, and Bill Reimer, who's one of our speakers uh, from Quebec and Concordia, with important support from Bruno Jean and Luc Bizon as well at the University of Quebec Rimouski campus. We were interested in topics such as understanding changes that have been happening in regional development in Canada, important innovations in regional development, and the application of ideas from the literature around something referred to as new regionalism. Regional government was a really important part of that, and certainly municipal actors are very important players within regional development in Canada. So part of our research certainly looked at governance and regional government within that. And so one of the provinces in which we did our work, we did work in the four provinces that I mentioned, was Quebec and some of the learnings that came out of the project uh, that were particularly interesting were those around uh, the MRCs. So looking forward to uh, hearing what the speakers have to do to say today, but also to this opportunity for us to to share some of the, the insights that we also uh, heard and learned about through our work. And also like to mention that Municipalities Newfoundland and Labrador has been an important partner in this work and continues to be. So thank you, Craig, for taking the lead in the session today. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. Uh, so the session is going to have a pretty simple format. Uh, up front, we've got uh, Dr. Bill Reimer, who's Professor Emeritus at uh, Concordia University and an adjunct professor at Brandon. Uh, he's directed two major research policy networks related to rural and northern issues. Uh, Bill served as the director and I think one of the founding directors of the Rural Policy Learning Commons from 2014 to 2017. Uh, he's also been a big player, a big uh, mentor of a bunch of us with the Canadian Rural Revitalization Foundation. Uh, Bill's going to talk about the history of the uh, MRCs and uh, the role, their, their role in the development of rural policy and issues in Quebec. Next, we've got Jean Dion, who is currently the Deputy Executive Director of Regional Operations at the Quebec Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Land Occupation. Uh, Jean holds a master's in public administration and a master's in community development. Uh, he's going to talk about sort of an introduction to the MRCs uh, or RCMs, uh, an overview of their roles, their powers, their funding, uh, how they liaise with the uh, Quebec government. When Jean is done, we'll have about 15 minutes for questions. Uh, and as has already been pointed out, there's a little Q&A box so you can submit your questions. I'll see them and then I'll ask them of the, uh, the panelists. When that process is done, uh, we're going to clue up with uh, Dr. Bruno Jean. Uh, Bruno is going to speak about, well, Bruno is Professor Emeritus at the University du Québec, Rimouski. Uh, he focuses on the teaching of the sociology of development, environmental sciences, environment and society, methodology, rural development, and local governance and he was involved, deeply involved, in the design of the Quebec National Rural Policy. Uh, Bruno, Dr. Jean is going to speak about uh, challenges facing the RCMs into the future, and then we'll have about 15 minutes for questions uh, at the end as well. So, without further ado, uh, I'm going to call on Bill Reimer to uh, start his presentation. Well, thank you very much, Craig. Um, I'm going to see how well I do with respect to um, my own uh, sharing of the screen. Here we go. Okay. So far, so good, I believe. 
All right, I'm presuming that, uh, that this, is, this is working okay. What I'm going to do is to take maybe about uh, 10 minutes just to provide some historical background to the current organization of regional governance in Quebec. Um, looking at this social and in institutional legacy of the way in which it's organized is really, I think, pretty critical to to uh, the understanding where we're at and where some of the places are that we can go. And this includes both the formal and the informal ways that uh, regional areas or regions or people in those regions gather information, communicate with one another, identify their common interests, resolve their conflicts because there's always gonna be conflicts, distribute resources and generally build trust among themselves um, that plays such an important role in the success or failure of specific approaches to regional organization. It's what we social scientists call social capital. And to no ignore it, it means at best the squandering of opportunities for collaboration. And at worst, the increased chance of failure as people react to the loss of familiar and trusted ways of doing things. In Quebec, the organization of regional territories, I feel, is based in social relationships and associations that go back many, many years. I think over 150 years, for example, uh, to a period of time when the church was the primary for formal organization in rural areas. It provided the venues and the infrastructure for collaboration, both within and across territorial regions. And these territories were largely identified and governed through parish, municipal, and county organizations. In 1855, for example, they were formalized through the establishment of municipal counties. Originally, they were based on electoral boundaries. Uh, even though they have been modified a great deal since then, they're still, they still reflected in the, both the informal and the formal identification and identity among important local infrastructure, including the places that people gather and the important sources of local financing. Uh, the Case Populaire, for example, is a, an important one that, you, that originated in most parishes. One of the biggest changes that occurred in the 1960s was when Quebec underwent what we call the Quiet Revolution. This was a period of time when health, education and social services were transferred from control by the church to the state. And it included a radical shift in the self-understanding of Quebec society, but that regional infrastructure and the social relations particularly remained largely the same. In 1979 to 1983, the formal redefinition of those municipal counties to Municipalité Régionale de Comté, that's where we, we get the MRC reference, or in English, uh, you'll hear us talk about the RCMs, or the Regional County Municipalities. Some territories remained outside this structure. For example, some several, um, municipalities within large urban regions and some Aboriginal reserves. It was within this organizational and social legacy that Quebec's rural policy was developed, and it gave priority and resources to these RCMs. The first rural policy was in 2001 to 2007, and its objective was to stimulate and support sustainable development and the prosperity of rural communities. It was going to contribute to the quality of life in rural communities to make them more attractive. And importantly, it supported citizens' general engagement in the development of their communities and contributed to the capacity of rural people and organizations. Note the multi-sectoral uh, uh, approach that's in, uh, created here. And in general, this created a very rich environment for the development of local capacities in governance and, governance and collaboration. Those that participated in the RCMs learned how to collaborate at a regional level. 
they learned how to access resources from both the public and the private sectors. And in general, they increased their confidence that deals that could be made would be respected beyond the five or four year election cycle. This is very critical for them, their ability to make compromises and to make long-term arrangements among themselves. The OECD did a territorial review of this first policy and was very favorable, although there were several aspects that were flagged as needing development. Those are reflected in the changes made for the second rural policy from 2007 to 2014. As a result of this change, they strengthened the role played by the municipal elected representatives and consolidated the R RCM's involvement in rural development measures. This was broadly defined rural development. They ensured that each territory had the means to act with a budget of $280 million. And they established rural pacts between the RCMs and the government, and they supported development of, uh, officers and regional offices. This encouraged a development dynamic centered on the territory. And I think one of the most important elements was the establishment of special programs controlled by the RCMs for the devitalized communities within their boundaries. This made, them a, this made it a regional issue, not a community issue. And by providing additional resources, the, even these devitalized communities could be see, become an asset for the RCMs rather than a liability. The second rural policy also continued this multifaceted development approach. It fostered cooperation and complementarity between rural and urban areas. It promoted the rural way of life and it offered concrete support from the government with respect to the various approaches and strategies and the various projects within those rural communities. By the time the second policy was completed and evaluated, it was clear that these initiatives were generally winning propositions. The third policy from 2014 to 2024 recognized this by a longer term commitment, more resources and expanded support through the rural agents. By 2014, the rural policy had survived two major shifts in government with considerable support. In 2014, however, uh, the new government took over and they immediately implemented an austerity program that has significantly changed the configuration of rural and regional governance in the, pro in the province. They eliminated, for example, the rural PACs and the rural laboratory programs. They drastically reduced support for the rural development agents. And in sum, this looked like the end of the 14-year rural policy initiative that has been internationally recognized as one of the few success stories in rural and regional developments. From my optimistic, generally optimistic point of view, there is one bright light in this story, however. The RCM regional infrastructure had over these 14 years developed a level of capacity that was relatively strong. It remains to be seen whether this capacity is sufficient to survive the various financial cuts and related organizational changes imposed by the government. And this is what I'll be looking for when we turn to uh, John and Bruno's discussion of the current situation. But before that, I just want to point out some of the things that I've learned uh, as a result of the Quebec experience. These are lessons that can inform regional organizations in other locations and with other historical legacies. They also emerge from a comparative analysis, both done by the OECD and by the Canadian Regional Development Project that Kelly has been leading over the last six years. This allows us to do some provincial comparisons. In general, I think we've learned that effective regional development policy requires a multi-sectoral and multi-departmental approach. 
rural and regional issues are inherently complex. They're not just an economic or a business issue, or even an agriculture issue. This requires an approach that takes advantage of the historical legacies in the regionals that we're looking at. In Quebec, for example, as I briefly indicated, these rest in the institutional, demographic, and cultural legacies of the church and its secularization. In Ontario, by comparison, we see that there are different traditions of social mobilization in the northern part of the province, in the southern part, around Toronto, and in the eastern part, and these need to be recognized. In Newfoundland, the regional isolation with different modes of governance and particularly self-reliance need to be integrated into any provincial level plan. And in BC, we see some really interesting regional initiatives and their formalizations by using trusts and bands and um, indigenous peoples, bands and councils that provide innovative ways to organize collective action. We've also learned that this requires the allocation of regional rights and responsibilities with adequate control of resources to support them, and they not, need not be a top-down approach. The assignment of the RCM responsibility for devitalized communities in their territory, in the case of Quebec, is an interesting one. With the provision of additional resources, this ends up being a good example of the innovative way in which one can deal with reorganizing rights and responsibilities. I think most important is, uh, is the benefit of a consistent long-term approach. This allows regions to learn how to work among themselves and with others. It allows them to make mistakes. It allows them to have conflict and it gives them enough time to figure out ways around it. And eventually it provides a stable context in which compromise can take place. People are not going to compromise without that kind of a stable um, uh, environment in which to do it. It also tolerates the inevitable failures so that people can learn from them. And finally, I would say it also requires a continuing demand for research, for knowledge mobilization, and political action. So this is the context in which we turn to look at Quebec regional governance today. So what has happened since 2014? Well, it's 14 years of relatively consistent regional organization and support enough to build the capacity of RCMs to a point where they can survive the financial and organizational shock of austerity? Have they been able to preserve the best of the Quebec model? And I'm going to turn to Jean and to Bruno to consider some of these issues in their presentations. So thank you very much for this opportunity. Thanks very much, Bill. Appreciate it. Uh, next, we're going to go right into uh, Jean Dion to give his presentation. And then once he's done, we'll have 15 minutes or so of uh, questions. Remind you that if you've got a question, there's a button you can click to submit that question, and I'll be able to uh, read it out to the, to the presenters. So with no further delay, Jean, we'll hand it over to you. Hi there. Uh, so first, uh, thank you for uh, the organizers to uh, give me the opportunity to to share with you some thoughts and information about the uh, RCMs in Quebec. So uh, my presentation will be uh, mainly an overview about uh, what are the structures, powers, democratic functioning, but also um, to follow on Bill comments, what are the uh, current challenges? Uh, are, all the uh, RCMs are dealing now with are, they deal now with uh, the issue of regional and local development. So, first, just a quick reminder reminder about uh, the sharing of responsibilities between Quebec government and municipalities. Uh, I know it can vary a bit among provinces, so maybe just a quick recap. So, of course, health and social services is government. Education is government only. Income support and job training is government. And after that, you have a bunch of shared responsibilities like housing, 
uh, social housing mainly, roads, so you have provincial roads and uh, local roads, of course. Police, fire, the fire uh, prevention and uh, fighting. Civil emergencies are uh, under uh, are shared responsibilities between uh, provincial government and uh, municipalities. Culture, recreational activities, it's also a shared responsibility. Parks, uh, because you have provincial parks and regional parks, it's a shared responsibility between municipalities and government. Economic development, but I could add also uh, community development and regional development is a shared responsibility. Land planning and town planning is shared responsibility. Public transportation, waste management, water, water supply and uh, uh, treatment of uh, wasted water is a municipal responsibility. So basically, um, it, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's useful to, to keep it in mind when we'll see the, what is the role of uh, the MRCs, because as Bill said, the MRCs or RCM have a very important role in local, regional, uh, development and community development, but it's also kind of uh, have also very important um, responsibilities in terms of providing services to the citizen. So that's my next slide. So we saw what were the municipal, local councils uh, powers. So. The RCMs are in fact a second level municipal power where you uh, authority, so where they are responsible for land planning. So they, they have to um, adopt a land planning document and the local town, plan, town planning uh, documents have to be coherent the, with the, the, the general uh, document which are, is adopted by the RCM. They are also responsible for the management of regional parks. Uh, as Bill said, they are responsible for regional, local and community development. It's a shared responsibility. Uh, more technical stuff, property valuations, says for non-payment of municipal taxes. Uh, they have to adopt uh, uh, residual material management plan. So it doesn't mean that they have to provide services, although that they can do that, but they have to, to, to adopt a general plan and uh, the local municipality has to conform to this, uh, to this uh, general plan of uh, management of uh, residual material. Uh, they have this in the same same kind of matter. They have to adopt a fire safety uh, cover scheme. So they, ne they are not necessarily responsible for fire fighting and prevention, but they have to uh, adopt a master plan. So it's a very important um, responsibility for RCM. Water courses management, they have to make sure that uh, there's no obstacle in the water courses and they have to uh, prevent flooding and this kind of problems. A, one very important uh, role, and I think it could be of some uh, interest for uh, friends from uh, uh, Newfoundland and Labrador, the acts if, if they were a local municipality in the non-organized territories. So basically where the, um, in a uh, locality where they're, they're, the population is not large enough or the, there's a very low density, that's the RCM, which is the, uh, which, which plays the roles of a municipality. So these are the basic powers of an RCM. And I will uh, go back and, uh, and we'll reflect uh, later on the question uh, asked, uh, raised by Bill on what is the future of regional and local and community development within the, with the MRCs. Um, another thing you have to keep in mind, which is very, very important for the future of RCMs, is they may declare, an RCM may declares may declare is jurisdiction in respect to local municipalities. It means that um, the council of RCM could say, well, we'll take care of these services to the citizen. Uh, it will be delivered now by the RCM. Uh, 
though that, but if an RMC, RCM decreases, it will exert its powers uh, normally um, exercised by local municipalities, uh, one or two or three or few municipalities within the RCM territory can oppose it. But they just cannot, cannot oppose it if it's, uh, this decision is concerning, for example, social housing, regional ma material, local roads, or public transportation. What it means that uh, an RCM could well decide that uh, it will be responsible for social housing for the old, its old territory, and then um, one or two or three municipalities can't just can't oppose it and the, serv the, the service will be uh, provided by the RCM. So it's maybe just a quick overview about what are the responsibilities of RCMs and uh, are the, um, the, the, um, the, the contribute to the, uh, to the, uh, lo the providing of local services to services to the citizen. So I go to the next line. Oops, I've got a problem here. Just a sec. Okay. So a council of RCMs is composed of by the mayor of each member municipality. Uh, it's possible also to, to have other members of the municipalities. It depends, it varies from a, an RCM to another. Uh, the prefect may either be elected by universal suffrage, but most of the time the, the, the prefect is designated by the council among the mayors. Um, so um, the, the most dominant way to design the prefect of the RCM is to be uh, designated by the uh, council among the mayors. We have 14 municipalities, 14 RCM where uh, the prefect is elected by universal. Uh, and that's a, a choice that, were made, that was made by these uh, specific RCMs. Usually, uh, you can see this kind of uh, way to elect the prefect in rural uh, regions. So where there is no major central city, but uh, a group of um, uh, rural communities, that's where you, you're, it's more likely that you'll find this kind of way to, uh, to uh, elect your uh, prefix universal suffrage. So we have 14 of them in Quebec. Um, another important th um, uh, thing you have to know, you've got to know about the RCMs is uh, very often you have a central city, uh, urban agglomeration with uh, let's say five or 10 or 15 others, uh, mid-sized or small low rural communities. So very often, you know, the central city, they have uh, the, more than 50% of the population of the RCM so that there's a democratic representative uh, issue there. The way it was solved is that you have to, you got to have a double majority. So for example, if uh, you have more than 50% of the population of an RCM, uh, you, you just can't impose your rule because you have to, to the vote is counted two ways at the council of the RCM. You have to um, take into account the population. So if you have more than 50% of the population, uh, you can't impose uh, your uh, will to the council because you must have also uh, the majority of the votes. So very often uh, the uh, local rural communities, they have to, to discuss with the central city just to find an agreement, to find some sort of consensus on an issue. And it's the same thing from the, for the central city because the central city just can't impose its, its will through the other uh, rural areas. So that's what we call the uh, double majority road. Just a uh, few comments on um, the Quebec context, the Quebec system of uh, local and regional, um, the, the local and regional structures in Quebec because it, it will help 
you to understand what Bill said and what is is what what we can perceive, what we can see, what that will happen for the future. For, for example, you have to, for first, you have to, to know that there are 17 administrative regions in Quebec. Uh, it varies from, let's say, Montreal Island, which is uh, 1.8 million people, to, uh, let's say, uh, La Côte Nord, which is the uh, neighboring region of uh, Newfoundland and Labrador, which is uh, a little bit less than 100,000 people. Uh, there are also two metropolitan communities, Montreal and Quebec City, uh, metropolitan areas. Uh, 14 municipalities uh, are not RCMs, but they have um, uh, the powers of an RCM. So we're talking, uh, we're thinking about uh, talking. Uh, sorry about uh, Montreal, Quebec City, mainly um, cities uh, of more than a hundred thousand people, inhabitants. There are 87 RCMs. In Quebec, 1,100 local municipalities, one minister of municipal affairs in land occupancy, and 17 regional ministers. Uh, and of course, they are have also cabinet responsibility, but usually the ministers in the province of Quebec have, have two different set of responsibilities. They are, say, minister of housing, minister of health and social services, and usually they have the, also the responsibility for a region. So you have this network of the 17 uh, regional ministers. Uh, they meet uh, and uh, their meeting, uh, uh, the meeting of the, the 17 regional ministers is chaired by the municipal affairs and land occupancy. And you, the, the, the deputy minister is also responsible. We do the same thing with his uh, deputy minister's colleagues. Uh, you have also in each uh, region, a regional administrative conferences. Basically, it's the uh, regional branch of uh, the government departments and uh, the um, they work together. Uh, their, their main role is to work with the local MRCs, RCM, sorry, and with the regional minister to support local and regional development. And uh, the uh, regional administrative conference is chaired by the uh, regional director of the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Land Occupancy. So that's basically uh, how it's structured in Quebec. Just to give you uh, some, give you a more. Um, you know, image vivant, something a bit uh, which will tell you a little bit more about uh, how it is organized in Quebec. So you have the 17 administrative region, for example, Montreal, very uh, small in terms of territory, but very um, populated. And uh, so usually we say that we have the uh, metropolitan regions uh, surrounding Montreal, we have the central regions. Uh, over there, and we have uh, the the regions uh, which are, you know, uh, we say with um, natural resources. So usually, the the more uh, you know, for example, natural resources. Of course, you know, uh, the 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 territory is extremely vast, is large, but the population usually is very slow. So our friend Bruno is from. Uh, Bas Saint Laurent, the number uh, uh, number one, and I'm going to talk uh, just to give you some uh, more information. I'll talk to you about La Côte Nord, North Shore, which is the region, the neighboring region of uh, Newfoundland Labrador. So, in on the North Shore, you have uh, six different RCMs. Just to give you an example, uh, it varies a lot. For example, the Old Côte Nord, you have uh, I think. It's uh, nine municipalities, uh, 11,000 people. Manicouaga, which is a very typical RCM, a little bit more than 30,000 people with uh, urban agglomeration, two thirds of the population, which is uh, Bécomo. Sept Rivière, not very typical uh, RCM, 35,000 people, but only two municipalities. Sept Hill is 25,000. Megany, which is a very typical uh, rural RCM, no central city, no urban agglomeration, nine municipalities, 6,500 6, 6, people. Golf Saint Laurent, uh, over there, very close to Labrador, uh, a little bit less than 5,000 people, five municipalities, and Canapisco, it's uh, basically Chefferville, close to Labrador City, and uh, Fermont, uh, two municipalities, 4,000 people. So, 
keep in mind that uh, Montreal has the as the power of uh, RCM it is 1.5 million million people, and you have Canapisco, which is, which is 4,000 people. So between behind, sorry, the concept of uh, an RCM, you have many many different realities, uh, but somewhat similar powers. Just some additional information. I go really, very rapidly on it. Uh, there are also for uh, Montreal, uh, Montreal Metro. Metropolitan Council covers 4 million people, 82 municipalities, 14 R RCMs. Council is chaired by the mayor of Montreal. Same thing for Quebec City. Uh, so the re I'm just presenting it to you because just to, you get to understand that in the metropolitan area, RCMs, they also belong to a larger scheme, which is the, the metropolitan uh, community. And metropolitan communities, the planning council on land planning, economic development, waste disposal, transportation, water management, environment. So it's a very, very quick overview of the um, system in Quebec. Uh, I do realize that uh, it's just an overview. If you have a specific question, I can uh, answer to your question. Uh, the next, uh, the next uh, point, uh, the next uh, further in the meeting, but uh, in a, I can also share with you some documents. Um, now let's go with uh, I think which are three um, major challenges for uh, the RCMs. As Bill said, uh, the Quebec government changed this approach uh, two years ago. There, so there's a new local and regional development policy. Basically, the, uh, the regional conferences, so in each administrative region, you, you had the regional conferences of elected officials, basically the prefects and um, mayors from major municipality in uh, one administrative region it was abolished uh, local development center which were responsible for local economic development was they were abolished and rural development policy was abolished too um, the uh, Quebec government made its statement that the first government partner for local and regional development uh, was the RCM so um, their approach was, well, the minister at the time said that he, said that he wanted to simplify the relation between um, the, the elected official, municipal elected official and government, and that they want to work mainly with RCM. Uh, they asked uh, various, uh, the uh, various government department used to sign uh, development agreements on very different topics uh, with the regional conferences which were abolished uh, so uh, government de the departments were asked to sign their agreements with the MRCs. Uh, a few months ago the government uh, asked to the MRCs to uh, sit together, work together. So we, let's say, for, for example, in the Lac Haute Nord, North Shore, there are six MRCs. Uh, they were asked to work together and to defend regional priorities. So um, the, 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 they're working they're do, on their regional priorities in terms of local and regional development. And there will be a special fund set up to uh, finance uh, the activities to support uh, the, the, um, the, 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 these regional priorities. Uh, government, uh, the Quebec government also have a land occupancy strategy. Um, we had this kind of strategy for a few years now, was not very successful. And the, but this time they want to base their, um, their work, the government wants to base, we really wish to base his work to on a, on a bottom-up approach. So the uh, new uh, Quebec government land occupancy strategy will be based on the, the regional priorities, the uh, work uh, done throughout the region of Quebec. So that's about how it's going to be worked uh, in the future. So the, so the, we, now you have two different funds, one for the RCMs. Uh, basically the RCM, they do 
whatever they want with uh, this uh, supralocal fund, which is called Fonds de Développement des Territoires, so they can finance initiatives uh, which were uh, financed by the uh, National uh, Rural Policy. Uh, they can finance the work, uh, they can, can support the work of um, the, which was uh, performed by the local development centers. And uh, they can do many other things with this uh, fund provided by uh, provincial government. At the regional levels, so at regional levels, uh, a fund of $30 million and it will uh, be, uh, it will go uh, b bigger and bigger up to 100 million for the old province. Uh, it will be used to finance um, action to support the uh, regional priorities. Um, also, um, the regional administration conferences, which are chaired by the regional directors of the Ministry of uh, Municipal Affairs, they have a new role. They have to interact with the uh, MRCs, they have to interact with the local departments government departments and with the ministry uh, responsible for the region in terms of supporting the MRCs in their work with the other de departments and also to um, to uh, work on re the, the achievement of regional priorities. I don't know why, okay. Uh, another major topic for RCMs is sustainable land planning. Uh, gov the, the government will have uh, new orientations in terms of um, land planning, a new partnership approach, uh, not so much in terms of controlling, but working together. That's the general approach. Two major issues uh, within, with, within the um, metropolitan area, try to have a better control of urban sprawl. The, uh, the the space occupied by uh, uh, urban space is growing still growing faster than the population, which is a major concern. Uh, but also a, ma a specific approach for slow growth to uh, devitalized uh, communities because you don't have the same kind of issues. We used to have a wall to wall approach to uh, land planning, and uh, I think that this time. Uh, the reality in, uh, of the rural communities will be taken in account into uh, the or governmental orientation regarding um, land planning. Um, rural um, RCM, they have to deal with uh, the arrival of uh, boomers, request for natural environments and low density, which is kind of could be a very um, good opportunity for them. It's also a challenge because the boomers in their early mid 60s want to, um, to, to, to live in uh, uh, low dense cities. Sometimes they go, uh, they don't want to, to live in the center of the villages. So what will happen in 10 years from now when they will get 70, 80 years and also it put a lot of pressure on, on uh, the cost the delivery cost of municipal services. So it's a major uh, land planning issue for uh, rural areas. Climate change, uh, more and more and more. We had huge uh, floodings, flood, or you say that uh, inundation floodings, uh, events in uh, the Montreal region and uh, uh, bank erosions in the Gaspé region and uh, in the no on the North Shore. Uh, so it's a major, major challenge. And uh, sometimes uh, we will have to decide uh, some neighborhoods will have to be moved uh, away from the water courses. Uh, so just a rough estimate if we would move everybody, which is now in uh, where there's a potential from flooding or banks erosion, it would be cost more than a billion dollar to government. So it's a major issue for the future to have a, uh, a land planning will take in account the um, climate changes. Last thing, uh, municipal intercooperation, uh, the, uh, the the responsibility services to citizens are more get are getting more and more and more complex. Um, we have many, many small municipal, many small municipalities, 
uh, 800 municipalities are on, on, on their two or 3,000 people with very limited resources. They just can't afford. So what are the solution of the future? Um, we have also devitalized communities in some areas. Um, Intermunicipal agreements, merging, services private provided by the central city, uh, municipal uh, specialized corporation delivery, delivering uh, services for many municipalities. And I, as a question mark, I said, and the RCM, because uh, what we can observe is, although the, uh, the RCMs were created to made this kind of uh, needs from local municipalities, local municipality, they tend to go different paths, you know, uh, uh, they, they have uh, agreements, two or three of them together. Um, sometimes services will be provided by the central city. Uh, they will set up uh, an independent uh, corporation and the RCM is a solution, but I have to admit it's not it's, it's not the most popular solution. And uh, just to go back as a final comment um, on RCMs, they were created uh, almost 40 years ago now. And I think Bill could uh, correct me on it, but the thought at the time was to have the RCM as the main partner of uh, Quebec government in terms of providing services at the local level, in terms of, uh, policy making at the local and regional levels. But years after years after years, uh, Quebec government uh, created, uh, you know, uh, departments created their own uh, partner in each uh, regions. So you had, uh, that's how you had the local development centers, uh, touristic uh, regional uh, agency, this kind of things. So um, each time there was a need, uh, there was a department in the, the government create, created, creating its own antenna, its own uh, partner, regional partner in the, at the regional level. So uh, I understand that uh, the, there was an issue of budget cutting and the last reform of um, regional, uh, local and regional development, but there was also, an, uh, I think, a wish, a will, a political will to go back to the origin of uh, the, the, uh, the, origin, the, the role, the, the, the basic role at the time of the RCM, which was the, to be the, the partner, the first partner of the Quebec government for uh, providing services to citizens and also to, to poly, for policy making in terms of local and regional development. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jean. Uh, a lot of information in there, and we've got a, a couple questions here. Um, one from me, uh, but I will read the first question out, and I think perhaps this one, uh, Bill might want to take a, a crack at this, and then Jean might want to take a crack at it as well. It's from John Bryden, uh, who is in Sweden. I think some of our panelists know John fairly well. Uh, he says, we have a lot of discussion about broad and narrow rural regional policy these days in the light of political changes and voting patterns. Austerity has led to major cuts in broad rural regional policy when compared with narrow rural policy. People in the periphery are voting by their vote, are, are protesting, sorry, by their vote. Is there any discussion of this happening in Quebec? So maybe Bill, we can start with you and then we can go to Jean. Uh, nice to hear from you, John Bryden, all the way from Sweden. Um, that I, I don't know whether I have uh, come across a lot of uh, discussion around the broad and narrow distinction that you're making in that, John. Um, uh, so I, I think, um, I presume that the that the narrow refers to a very specific uh, policy initiatives or to actions that are taken as opposed to the broad being more the general approach uh, approaches that we've been talking about here including for example the the role of the 
RCMs as the as the primary focus for for the in this case provincial government. Um, I I I think I'm going to defer to Jean and to Bruno uh, on this one uh, because uh, my my experience has not been a lot around that particular distinction. Okay, Jean. Well, I mean, um, to um, when you, you talk, you speak to a Quebec citizen, I mean, he belongs to a municipality, maybe he belongs to a region, that depends on the region. RCM, the sense of belonging to an RCM, it's not that strong, I'd say, you know, it's, it's it's there, but the, I, I think that the, the, the people, they really belong to their municipality, even though sometimes it's not viable anymore. So this, all these changes uh, with uh, uh, the uh, policy, uh, all these cutbacks, I mean, uh, we have not really observed uh, a major uh, concern expressed by a large share of the population. Of course, uh, many, many uh, people who are involved into development processes uh, or elected officials, particularly in the, you know, uh, re the region, I, I would name uh, region re with uh, the resource naturelle, region with natural resources. You know, there was, uh, there was uh, some people who were very upset about the changes. But uh, I, I couldn't say there was a lot, very large uh, protest observed in the population. Sure. Uh, we've got another question now from uh, the online participants. Uh, Brian Beaton has, uh, says, it seems to me that an important gap in the research required is a critical examination of how RCMs are playing an important role in moving regional and provincial further and further away from local citizens and communities especially rural, remote, small communities. The presentations have a lot of information about the development and roles of the RCMs, with a strong emphasis on their strengths and responsibilities. How is the research capturing the experiences of people in remote, rural, small communities, especially the indigenous who are avoiding these regional governance groups? So maybe, Bill, again, we can, we can start with you and then switch to Jean. And Bruno may want to jump in here as well. I mean, your presentation is coming up in a minute, but maybe after Bill and Jean, we can have a quick comment from you as well. Okay. Um, I, I think the... Oh, you're muted, Bill. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. In my own case, um, a lot of this information, research information, comes from the work that uh, I've been doing with Kelly Vaudin's team. Uh, where we have been interviewing people at the local level, and we've also been look, uh, interviewing people at the regional level, and, and in some cases, the provincial level as well, partly to find out what is the relationship between the, the general policies that you find and what is happening on the ground, and is there, a, is there much of a connection uh, between those? We've also been looking at the way in which this varies by provinces because we've got in the Canadian situation some nice differences among the, the um, provinces. Uh, one of the things that uh, we particularly looked at is how the information moves uh, between the lo very local level, the people who are working in the associations and the groups um, often non-government groups within the local area, and the regional level and the, the provincial level. We found, first of all, that, the, that there's, there's not that much information exchange, that if we were asking the local people about how they, uh, who do they turn to if they want some information about uh, decisions that they have to make, uh, it remains relatively distinct from what I would call a more systematic type of research, uh, and that it depends a great deal on the uh, uh, who, who they know and anecdotes and stories and so on and so forth that's informing them as they're making those decisions. I would hope 
that in the uh, Quebec situation, for example, the, the mayors meeting on councils and having meetings can break into that a little bit by having uh, access to information that's more than just their neighbors and, and people in their local community. But it hasn't been uh, that remarkable even within the Quebec situation. So uh, that's, that's the kind of uh, objective that we've been trying to deal with from the point of view of, of Kelly's research in answering the kind of question that you have, have raised. And I, I think the other, the other part of it is that uh, in, in British Columbia, for example, where there's uh, a lot of indigenous groups that are now ju just now negotiating with the provincial government. In the East, a lot of them have already established treaties, but in the West, and particularly in British Columbia, it's, it's wide open. And there we are finding some really interesting reconfigurations of how those local communities want to organize themselves. And I, I, from a research point of view, this is rather exciting to me because it, uh, some of the ways in which they have organized themselves to do that work uh, are, are quite uh, new or innovative. I'd be really excited to see how it works out. Great. Jean. Hello. Yeah. Uh, just uh, for, for the question of uh, John Bryden, broad or narrow rural policy, in front of, uh, I'm sorry, I don't. Uh, know the difference with those policy in Europe, so I, I cannot comment. But on, on the second question or comment, uh, it's clear uh, for me that uh, the uh, uh, rural uh, uh, county municipality, RCM, are, in my view, very, fits very well in a more rural, small community era. Uh, uh, because uh, otherwise they don't have the each of them they don't have the financial capacity to maintain our service and there are some service and very important today the waste management uh, uh, fire I mean uh, so if uh, I mean, uh, RCM organized for with them those service it you there's a uh, they can maintain service uh, and also they maintain a local local government so it's a, in my view a very nice uh, organization the problems uh, as I will mention in my small talk in a few seconds uh, the problems arrive uh, arise uh, comes with in uh, as Jean Dion uh, mentioned uh, RCM in a territory with many small villages around the big city or big, medium-sized city. Uh, so that's the linkage. It's quite difficult in that case. And the model maybe not fit very well in some place. But about the identity, it's interesting to say that in some place, there's a very strong identity that, that have been built around a specific era. Like near Rimouski here, we have the MRC Les Basques. Everyone there, they feel part of their small RCM Les Basques. Uh, in Rimouski, Nejet is less stronger, depends on various places. Uh, but overall, uh, RCM are something, in my view, what we have learned with some research, it's uh, something quite. Uh, uh, there's a sense of identity around RCM because the boundaries of each RCM have been designed in a way to respect some linkage between populations. So it's not uh, just an administrative, uh, you know, mapping like this in a, in, in our first in, in the nation capital. <laughs> but yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. Thanks very much, Bruno. Jean, uh, Jean Dion, I've got a question here that I think is probably best suited for you. Okay. Uh, this one from Sweden, uh, Karen at Resgard. She says, uh, we have a lot of amalgamation between municipalities going on in the Nordic countries. Uh, there are the following arguments for this, getting better expertise, saving money by often outsourcing. 
However, democracy uh, is also questioned as by amalgamating power, it tends to be centralized, getting more into the professional committees and away from citizens. Is that a trend in Quebec? Is that something that's being discussed in Quebec right now as a concern? Well, we had a, a wave of mergers or amalgamations, um, I would say, uh, 15 years ago. Major, major uh, wave of amalgamations. And now it's like uh, a no-no. Okay, I, don't, I just can't see any uh, political party having uh, forced mergings in on his political platform. Uh, from my own point of view, uh, 15 years ago, it had to be done particularly in the urban centers because of uh, the, the issue of, uh, you know, uh, everybody paying his fair share for expenses. So some, some, um, Affluent suburbs, they had a, some. I would say a free free ride. You know, all the costs were in were in the, paid by the central city, and often in uh, Quebec, uh, the uh, poorest uh, neighborhoods were in the central city, not in the suburbs, which is quite different from Europe. So I think uh, some work had to be done uh, a few years ago in Quebec, but. Uh, now I don't think uh, it's 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 on the ag political agenda because there was a major reason, uh, resentment uh, among the population. So it, it just can't be uh, defended at the political level. Now what we do observe is what we do see is two or three or four or five uh, mergers a year between two small communities uh, working together to um, to have a better way to provide services at a cheaper cost. But uh, this is a voluntary process. For example, let's say to a uh, local council of a, a thousand people together, they merge together and they have a, a new municipality of 2000 people. That's the, the kind of thing we see now. Okay, great. Uh, we have time for one more quick question. Uh, it's a follow-up question to an earlier one. And I think, Jean, uh, for time purposes, I'll focus this one on you as well. Um, and it's a question around the boundaries. Who decides the geographical size of each RCM? Uh, who decides the boundaries? How does that happen? Um, and then The RCMs? The RCMs, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it was done 40 years ago, and it hasn't changed much. As Bilix and Bruno explain, uh, it's deeply rooted into the histories, uh, mm -hmm. history and um, 19th century. Uh, I think that uh, Bill could explain it, but it was kind of natural boundaries. Um, uh, few villages, uh, parishes uh, being together uh, related to some sort of a social organization at the time with, uh, um, let's say, a major or a small center. And uh, my understanding, it, it was based on natural uh, boundaries, social, social boundaries. Um, and uh, it was done 14 years ago, but th even then, 40 years ago, it was based on a reality uh, which has been developing for, uh, since the mid of the 19th century. Sure. And is there, are there regular discussions about changing those boundaries? Or have they been stable and remain stable? They're fairly stable. It can okay. happen. It, uh, it happens, I would say, once in uh, every 10 years. Okay. The, it's no, I think uh, it's not very common. Right. Okay, we are, are done time for questions on this one, but we may have a little bit of time at the end for uh, sort of general questions. But next, I'd like to move to uh, Dr. Bruno Jean, who's going to talk to us a little bit about the challenges facing uh, RMCs in the future. Oh, I, I don't have my, sorry, like this. Is it okay? That's perfect. Okay. Uh, so like this, so it's the beginning. I'm not going to be very. Uh, I'm just giving some comments uh, on question we or comment we have start to discuss. Uh, I check the arrow. Uh, first about uh, governance. Uh, uh, 
RCM model maintained very small rural community with a local government elected and with a supra, supra local government that is RCM, supra local government that provides municipal service at a fair cost for citizen. Uh, in my view, we don't have so much regional government in Quebec right now. Uh, we have, a, you know, local government and a supra local government. And I think it's the wording our government used talking about uh, RCM. As uh, we uh, Jean mentioned also that regional county municipality are directed by a council of mayors. So it means that uh, in my uh, in that council there's only the uh, uh, elected people. There's no representative of the of we call civil society or even the business sector. So uh, so it's not a real governance we expect in a sense uh, or good governance because there's no place for uh, sharing the decision making between the three big forces so economics politics and social force they are, they are only uh, political so in a sense our uh, uh, rcm are a model with where where one supposed to fit all uh, but in my view it fits best in a territory territory without any central town lines. Jean mentioned the same thing. Uh, where is the arrow now? Uh, oh, uh, is it the now? Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, so we have two models of RCM. One is uh, RCM in a, with a group of small rural community. We, it has been mentioned earlier in the seminar today that we have 87 RCM. But from that, that uh, 87, I must say about 55, 56 are rural, we call it rural, rural. There's only rural place. Uh, and about 30 are um, uh, the second model where a, a big town surrounding by a small village. Uh, it was the case of uh, here in Rimouski Nejet, the RCM Rimouski Nejet, which is that era uh, central town Rimouski, very large, uh, counting for 85% of total population and more than 90 person of the property value of the RCM. Uh, so according to the democratic, uh, demo, demographic weight of the city, the mayor of Rimouski has something like seven votes at the RCM council. So he, if he got just one more vote from the rest of the rural community, he, he has a kind of, uh, he has the power. So, uh, it's, it's near a veto powers. Uh, on the other side, the mayor of uh, Rimouski said, well, but I put the money. <laughs> As a city, we put, uh, it's a share uh, according to demographic. So they, they, it's true that the city of Rimouski put a lot of money uh, in the RCM of Rimouski Nejet. Uh, uh, oh, so, so the question um, uh, is how could you well balance demography and democracy in that model, in that case? There's no perfect way, but it's clear that one size uh, fits all uh, is not very well because that two model and uh, it fits more for a small rural community model. Uh, I just, for the purpose of that seminar today, I just review some comments uh, I collect from prefect, elect or not elect in various places. Um, and uh, it's to, to, as Jean Dion mentioned, there's only 14 
uh, RCM, they decide to uh, elect by universal suffrage, by election uh, uh, all citizens. Uh, there's some uh, pro and cons about this. Uh, so, as we mentioned, the, the, each RCM have the choice uh, of uh, go in election or the council of mayor find someone between various uh, mayors. Uh, so, in my view, an elect prefect seems more appropriate for RCM with only small rural community. Uh, and I explain what that's only 14. Uh, and uh, the comments I collect for those who are in favor of election, general election for the prefet, it's like uh, something is demo more democratic. Uh, they create a sense of engagement for, for the, the citizen who, who uh, elect there. And, uh, and for the prefect, I have a student. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, one of my young students, a uh, girl, uh, a few years ago, she, she go an election, uh, she run, and she wins the election very easily, in a sense. It, 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 everybody was surprised. Uh, but she was working in that region. Uh, she was not elected before in a small village somewhere, and, and so on and so but uh, and she gained a, kind, a sense of uh, uh, legitimacy uh, because because of that election. She, she has the feeling that, well, uh, when I I'm talking, people are more listen listening because they know that I have been elected and so on. Uh, they said also it's more neutral, more neutrality because the prefect is not at the same time mayor of the of his own municipality, which is the case in the other model. Uh, they choose between uh, different mayor, uh, but this one became prefect and mayor of his own place, uh, so it might be conflicting uh, the, for some decision. Uh, and also, this the last uh, pro I found, uh, it's about the, the quality <laughs> or the competence of those person. Because a full-time elect prefect is like a job. Uh, it's, uh, they, they uh, agree to, to, the, to be paid full-time and they work full-time on that job So as a prefect. So it can attract uh, more highly uh, competent people. And uh, to finish, uh, some people's, uh, as I mentioned, the model seems not going well with uh, uh, election, I mean, uh, with uh, the model of RCM with a big, uh, big city. And in fact, I maybe Jean Dion know the answer, but I'm, I, I know, I don't have in mind uh, uh, elected prefer in uh, RCM with a more large uh, uh, city, center city. Uh, some people talk about the cost to organize election and the cost to have a full-time prefect. Uh, the mayor of city of Gaspé, you know Gaspé, <laughs> says, uh, well, why we, as a RCM, Gaspé is a large town, small village around, they said, well, the Gaspé have already a full-time paid mayor. And they said, well, if we uh, organize an election to have a prefet élu, uh, an elected prefect, we will have another full-time, uh, you know, prefet for the same re small region. It's, uh, it's too much. We don't need, you know, so we don't have to, it's an argument uh, some other place I have uh, listened to. Another, maybe a small, um, less important uh, uh, point is the fact that in the system, uh, uh, RCM, if a prefect 
do not work well and their colleagues want to remove him, it was quite easy. You know, it's internal decision and the... But if a prefect has been elected, it's like another election. We need, you need to, to wait the next election, the next four here, uh, to uh, remove the prefect. It's another point, I know. Uh, so the question of uh, prefect, elected prefect or not, uh, I think it's, it's, it's not a big debate in Quebec. It's a more part of a local decision of people. Uh, the two models are, I don't have any comments more. Is it better or not? I think it's good for a small, the model of RCM with very small rural community. Uh, but in the other model of RCM with a large city surrounding a small village, uh, it's like mentioned in Gaspe, uh, have an elect prefect might be uh, uh, no, not so much for a level. So thank you. Thank you very much, Bruno. Uh, I have a quick question um, that yeah. you will really get a very quick answer to, and then we've got two more questions waiting. If, uh, if a prefect or warden is elected directly, are existing councillors uh, existing mayors prohibited from running from that seat? Is it people? No, no, they don't. They, 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 if they run, they have to resign their their seat as, their seat as mayor. Okay. They don't. Okay. They, they cannot have the the cumul des mandats in French. <laughs> right. They can't be both. Uh, one of our questions from before, I think, applies here uh, again from Brian Beaton. How do urban and near urban government officials ensure local needs and programs are available and appropriate so that small, re remote, and rural communities are sustained and respected with respect to how the, the uh, RCMs are done? Uh, I'm sorry, you speak too fast. I need to <laughs> question. No, from Newfoundland. Yes. Yeah. It's an occupational hazard. Um, how do urban and near urban government officials? ensure that local needs and programs are available and appropriate so that small, remote, and rural communities are sustained and respected. And I think he's referring back to the question earlier about are rural, remote communities really feeling like they're part of this program? Yeah, uh, if I have catch correctly the question, uh, it's an important question, I mean. Uh, and a, a lot of discussion. Uh, it's like uh, I, I will take a very specific case, like a regional swimming pool for the population. You don't have. It's impossible to have a swimming pool in a small village. Access to the population. We have a swimming pool, public swimming pool here in, in the central town. It might be Trois-Pistoles in the MSC de Basque or, or here in Rimouski. But uh, how you organize the access to the service in a fair way for the population outside of the, those two towns. Uh, so they, that's, uh, uh, they call it in uh, Quebec uh, jargon or <laughs> wording, uh, service supramunicipal how we organize the access and share the costs, you know. And in my view, uh, it's RCM provide nice arrangement for this. In the past, uh, the, the, the city of Rimouski create two different co uh, access costs, I mean, uh, for their home citizen and outside, uh, but now they can arrange in, inside the RCM to have everyone access and a, a share of the cost according population and so on. So I think uh, uh, the interests of uh, citizen residents uh, and uh, rural people in the MRC, 
they can uh, more have, they can discuss, they can make decision and to, uh, create a better rural urban linkage, you know, for various uh, services. It, it's my own view, but in some cases it might be more difficult to arrange. But overall, I consider that uh, for some service, uh, it, it, it's a win-win solution. Right. It's okay that's your opinion. It's, it's, a, it's an informed opinion. That's why you're here. Um, another question, maybe this one for Jean Dion. In the areas or in the, the fields where RCMs have authority over local governments, because uh, you said there was several points where uh, the RCM has authority over or the municipality must do its work within the plan provided by mm -hmm. the RCM. I imagine there's a, a coordination factor that helps there, but do you also have pushback from the local municipalities in terms of the RCM uh, stifling their own their local authority? And it, what's the balance there? How does that work? Yeah, uh, well, many many situations. First, you have to keep in mind that you know that's the same people you know sitting on the. You have the mayor of the local municipalities, and then you have the same mayors uh, sitting on the the, the, the board of the uh, RCM. So uh, they have to discuss and they have to uh, reach an agreement. What do they need from their RCM? And uh, my experience, what we can observe very often is very often when it's not mandatory, when it's not mandatory you understand yeah, uh, yeah uh, the, the, the the local council will choose to let's see they will uh, start together a local uh, corporations to provide various kind of services you know RCM is not always the first solution uh, so and uh, when the the RCM has the power it, it, and to impose its will uh it's it's um it's a major challenge and i'm thinking about uh, land planning okay right. because uh government want more and more and more to control urban sprawl and if you try to control urban sprawl you ask your rcm to have uh, plans which will decide where the development will go and i'm talking about uh, you know uh, let's say communities surrounding the uh, urban centers and then you could observe major 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 uh, debates where will the development urban development goes because with the development come comes the property taxes which is the uh, the, the base of the final funding of the local municipality so land planning is a major uh, area for uh, discussions and it's an important challenge for the local elected official to reach agreements how they will organize land planning uh, within the RCM, major issue. Organizing of the um, services to the citizen, that's another ball game. They have many different options and they have a lot of liberty and a freedom, sorry. And it's very rare that the RCM will impose its will. If they get involved in two, uh, let's say uh, 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 delivering some specific services it will be at the request of local municipalities and there will be a strong consensus okay otherwise it will remain local or two or three municipalities will work together what we can see very often so we have one more question i think time just enough time for this one quick question and maybe i'll ask each of the panelists to give us their one minute uh, answer. I'll challenge you to, uh, and I'll time you. Um, Ruth Mealy has asked, what are the best successes of the RCM model? So maybe, uh, Jean, we can start with you, and then we'll go to Bruno, and then we'll go to Bill, and then we'll go back to Kelly to clue us up, because we're almost done. I don't know if it's the, the best success, but uh, one success story is uh, RCM getting involved in uh, the wind turbine uh, business, our um, local uh, hydroelectricity dams, 
and uh, the uh, the collect uh, redevance. How would you say redevance? You know. Uh, uh, money from the uh, developers and okay. it's re reinvested into uh, local development uh, or the get into joint ventures with uh, developers and I think it's very uh, interesting because uh, uh, some of the money generated by natural resources goes back to the community through the RCM and uh, within an RCM the mayors together have a much stronger bargaining power with provincial government, Hydro-Quebec or with uh, private developers. I think I, it's one of the success. Excellent. Uh, Bruno, uh, un unmute yourself. Yeah. Uh, I, w I remember when uh, those uh, local or super local government had been paid, paid, put in place in 1999, 1979, 1979. Uh, so uh, from uh, the, the, the RCM are becoming something very important for not only for providing service to citizens, important to organize uh, social and economic development at uh, at, at a scale a, a, a local scale uh, where people live all together so it's very impressive from recent like uh, wind power mentioned uh, how many how those uh, that government it's becoming it's becoming a real government for a long time, we don't know if it's a government or just uh, an administrative structure. It's becoming a real local government, important for the development, especially of a rural region in Quebec. Excellent. So, Bill, the last word. Uh, yeah, I, I, I just I think I'm building a little bit on what uh, Bruno has said. I I, I would see that the major uh, success has been the the 14 and now it's more than 14 years but but primarily the 14 year period where people were forced in a way uh, to build their local capacity and and a lot of that was done by uh, putting them around the same table in the early days giving them the resources and the responsibility and saying all right you you figure it out uh, don't keep coming to us, and and to me that the 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 related kinds of relationships that were built and the confidence and the, the what we mean by the capacity, the various investments that they've made and so on, I think has built a level of confidence over those years that is quite remarkable. So that's why I was so interested in. All right, now we cut that, uh, we cut the funds. Let's see, do they still, does that capacity manifest itself uh, during a period of, of bust it, it, from a, a regional point of view? And uh, I think, but I, and so far I'm, I'm feeling, uh, you know, a bit discouraged because they don't have the same resources and they don't have the support that they did, but also very optimistic in the sense that if we look at some of the initiatives that they've taken, uh, they seem to have learned. Uh, they they they're in better shape than they were. You know, if we had the austerity uh, 14, 15 years ago, I'm sure the outcome would not be as um, encouraging or op optimistic it, it, from my point of view. Anyway, excellent. So, so it's that building the capacity, I think, that has been the biggest success. Excellent. Well, thanks to all three panelists. Really appreciate your time and your insight. Uh, I'm going to hand it back to uh, Dr. Vaden now, who's going to clue things up for us and maybe talk about ways we can do this more in the future. Yes. Well, first of all, yeah, thanks to the speakers uh, from, from our team. Uh, really, lots of interesting content. I think we've all gained a greater understanding of the, of the system in Quebec. Thanks uh, to you, Jean, and to everyone 
Uh, Bruno, the challenges that you raised about rural urban dynamics are really <laughs> important, I think. Our study region in Quebec was the Rimouski area, so we heard a lot about this. Um, and, and it's something we have to work on in our province of Newfoundland and Labrador for sure, as well in, in areas where that would apply. Uh, but Bill, I really appreciated your point about thinking long term and allowing, recognizing that conflict will and does happen and building the ability over time to, to deal with those conflicts. Regional cooperation is never easy and there will always be disagreements and conflicts. So, uh, and the fact that uh, this is an ongoing effort is important, I think. It's 40 years in the making, but even in Ramuski area, we heard that. So we've, we've learned how to work together in many cases. We're working at it. It's, it's, it's improving uh, comments like we have stronger power when we have strong RCMs. But to keep this strength, we have to work together, not fall apart. So recognition that yes, there are those tensions, but we need to keep working at resolving them. So you you brought out all of those things in your comments. Thanks also to Craig for moderating and Sarah Minnis. I really wanted to mention you as well, Sarah, for your all your work putting this uh, webinar together, and certainly the RPLC uh, organizers. We do plan to do some more. So as Craig mentioned looking to the future. We would do the next one, I think, on the British Columbia uh, model. And uh, we're certainly interested in looking at other provinces also. So that's the regional districts in British Columbia. Uh, selfishly, from a Newfoundland Labrador perspective, we really want to learn about these models because we're, we're revisiting regional government and having a lot of discussions about the, that in the province. But I do think we can learn a lot from each other uh, across the country uh, in our experiences. So stay tuned for more. We do have a website for our research project, and it's a long one, but it's Canadian C D N R E G D E V, so Canadian Reg Dev dot ruralresilience.ca, or if you just go to ruralresilience.ca, you'll find us. We have a project there, uh, also a current project called Re Just Regional Government, and these webinars will be posted there and other resources, but they'll also be on the RPLC site, which I think uh, Monique mentioned as well. So. They're, it's been recorded and it'll be available for those that weren't able to make it or for those of you who want to revisit the webinar. I think that's it for thanks for now. Thanks. Great. Thanks very much, Kelly. And thanks everybody for attending. We, we managed to maintain about 33 people all the way through. So uh, that's pretty impressive for one of these webinars, I think. I'm happy. Yeah. So thanks again to you and your team for pulling it together. Thanks to the panelists. And thanks to everybody who participated. And now you're free to go. <laughs> Thanks again. Bye-bye.